Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Coffee Talks with Cartan. Uh, today we have a guest from Haiti, uh, Nisa Etienne. She's a former professional tennis player and she's also an Olympian. And she's going to tell her her story, how she got into tennis and how, how, how was her journey to the Olympics and to playing in Division I University in the U.S. So welcome, Nisa. Thank you for being with us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Yes, well, as you said, my name is Nisa Etienne. I was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And I mean, I think I grew up with a tennis racket in my hand as my grandpa, I started my grandpa, you know, he taught my aunts and my dad how to play tennis. And I remember I used to dance up to the age of three and my parents, my family on my dad's side, they opened a tennis academy called Jotak. And it started from there, you know, every afternoon my mom would go to the club and then I would go with her. And that's where my career started. And every day I would go and play tennis with my dad. So my dad was pretty much the one that got me through, you know, my career into tennis. Um, you know, at the age of, I think 11, I went to my first international competition in the DR and I won that competition. And I think that, you know, it opened the eyes of the ITF. And from there, you know, I was recruited to play a few tournaments internationally. And slowly I was, I was doing good, you know, and I started traveling a lot with the ITF and at the age of 13, the ITF opened a tennis camp in Panama and I was selected to, to, to go over there. So actually at the, at the age of 13, I packed up everything and left my family behind and I went to a center in Panama and yeah. And I think there it allowed me to take my tennis to another level. Because, you know, in Haiti, there's not many females that played. So I, I was allowed to play with the men. So I only played with the boys in Haiti, so, which was good for me. So it was a good yeah. change, you know, internationally and going to, to Panama and actually playing with girls my age. Because in Haiti, I only played with, with, you know, boys. So that was a nice change. And, you know, through, you know, me going to school there and playing tennis, I started traveling more and more. And my rankings started going you know, better and better. And at the age of 16, I was selected, you know, as Haiti being a country from the Caribbean, you know, a small country, I guess, you know, the Olympics, they tried to have, you know, give help to, 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 to you know, lower level countries. And given my good ranking, yeah. I was able to have a wild card. Yes, mm -hmm. I was able to have a wild card to go to the, to the Olympics. And whew, what can I say? I was 16, so <laughs> I guess... <laughs> It was an amazing experience. I don't, I don't, I don't know what else to, to say. It was just simply amazing. I think I was just amazed the the gravity of what was happening to me, you know, and and it's something I would cherish forever, you know. And I, I mean, I lost first round, but it, it was still an amazing experience, you know. And I, then I kept I playing those games in Sydney. Like those games were were one of the best games in the history. Yeah. I would say. <laughs> Yes, well, that was my only one, yeah. but it was just, it was spectacular, you know, and being surrounded by the best athletes in the world, you know, and it, it, it was just simply amazing, you know, and my dad came with me as my coach, you know, so it was super, super fun, you know, to be part of that, you know, and well, you know, again, you know, you have to go back into playing and I played professionally, well, I, when I finished my career in the juniors, of course, I transitioned to the professional circuit. Um, I played a few tournaments. It, it was going well. But, you know, Haiti being a poor country, I didn't have a lot of financial help. So we decided to go. I decided, well, you know, me and my family, we decided, you know, it would be best to just go to college. And which I did. It was amazing. I had, you know, it was an, an amazing time. And then once I was How done, I came back it? home. How just uh, uh, just a note there, like you you went to you, you went to the um, the Olympics. You were 16, and mm -hmm. then you got recruited to go to University of South, South Florida. And mm -hmm. uh, how did you get you get recruited through like a tournament? How 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 was that process? You, you went to high school well, in Florida, no, as well. Yes, I, I went to high school in Florida. I graduated in Florida. Um, 
Well, I have to say, I, I was being recruited by UF, a few, few universities when I went to the circuit, professional circuit, but I wasn't really interested in college at that time. I wanted to give it a try professionally. And, you know, it was too expensive and not having the help financially. Then I decided to go to college and I reach out to a few colleges. And I must say, because of my, you know, my results and my ranking, um, they were very open to hearing from me and very open to, ha you know, having me in their team. But I ended up choosing USF because Gigi Fernandez was the coach there at the time. And, you know, she was an amazing professional player. Um, so, and it was in Florida, you know, close to home not in Miami because I was already in Miami. I wanted to be a little bit away from, you know, what I was familiar with. So it was, it, it was an amazing experience. So I, that's how I decided to go to USF, you know? So I guess with my good results, that opened a lot of doors for me. Yeah, nice. And I mean, you, you went to college um, coming from Fort, Fort Lauderdale. And for what, how about your transition from Haiti to Miami, to Fort Lauderdale? Where, where, was that after the Olympics or how was that? No, well, my transition was the, the academy went to Panama. So I went to Panama first, the ITF. So that transition was hard because I didn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Spanish. And if you look at it, Haiti is practically the only country that speaks French. So <laughs> that, was a, that was a tough one, you know? And there was a Lisa Français there because I was at Lisa Français in Haiti. But my mom was like, you know, French, you're the only speaking you're young I want you to go to the American school with all the other kids so it was just uh how can I how's, say how's that your was... how's your your espanol because we have a lot of Spanish uh clients Wait, in what... Pakistan oh uh, my Spanish is not bad puedo hablar espanol no me voy a perder ningún lado que habla espanol me entiendes pero no practico mucho no, perfecto. pero si sí hablo you sound like a bit uh Dominican Puerto Rican You have yeah. your Spanish. Yeah, nice. Good. Well, I have, I have to thank my coach for that because one day in Panama, I remember him saying to me, listen, I'm not talking to you in English. I don't know French. I'm only speaking to you in Spanish. Whether you understand or not, that's your problem. <laughs> and that forced me <laughs> into learning. So I had the English at school because the English speaking, you know, tennis players and the Spanish. So for me, it was great because I didn't speak neither language, so I mingle with all with everyone. You know, I wasn't put in a corner, so it was great. And now today, I speak, you know, Spanish, English, so you know, eh, I'm happy for that now. You know, but I think that transition was probably the toughest because I was only 13. I went to a new country that I didn't know. You know, with yeah. kids, you know, no coaches language. I didn't know, no yeah. language, but it was a great experience. And then the economy itself moved to Florida. So that transition was a little bit easier because I was, I was already familiar with Florida, especially Miami. Well, we went to, I'm not mistaken, where was it? It was Pompano. Went to Pompano, which was, it was fine for me near Miami. You know, I, I, as a young kid, I used to go to Miami on vacation and I have family members that live there. So that transition was maybe smoother than Panama, you know? But by then I was already, I, I had already lived in a year and a half away from home. So, you know, I got used to it, you know, so it was fine. Yeah. No, and it was, it was good because then, because of that move of the academy to the U.S., that kind of like gave you the idea to, to go to college as well. And that, that's easy for colleges to recruit in the U.S., not recruiting in Panama or in Haiti, which I think that's exactly. that was key. Yeah, but I have to say also, being with an, an ITF camp, the ITF, the International Tennis Federation, really helped me a lot. I was traveling every January, February to South America, because that's their summer. We're playing there every summer, going to Europe. And then you had the Orange Bowl, Eddie here and, and Christmas. So I was always part of the ITF team, you know? So, you know, I have to say that Academy really opened a lot of doors for me, you know, in order I, to travel. I, I and International stuff. Tennis Federation. Yeah, the International Tennis Federation. Yeah. Nice. And uh, I mean, going, let's go back to your experience yeah. in Sydney. No, like you okay. were you were 16. Like <laughs> great uh, Australia, great country. Yeah, but you go into the Olympic Stadium in and how how was your feeling? I mean, what 16 year old uh living the dream, no? Like <laughs> did you imagine ever going to the Olympics and or how was that uh, how was that experience? Well, I mean, as a as a player, you always dream big, you know, wanting to 
I guess maybe my dream was maybe um, Wimbledon more than the Olympics because you know you think Wimbledon is so far fetched. It, it, I, I was speechless. I, I, you know, to be re- to 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 give to be given a wild card at 16, you know, was something that I will cherish forever. And walking on that stadium that day, it's something I'll never forget. To see the magnitude, how big it was. I think it's the biggest stadium I've ever been to in my life, you know. And to be able to walk for my country and represent my country along the best athletes in the world, I mean, there's nothing else, you know, you could ask for, you know. It, it was just simply amazing. You know, how I remember at ad- that. How many athletes from Haiti were were in the delegation? And usually, we joke that there's more, you know, um, representative than athletes for <laughs> Haiti. <laughs> But we were probably like a good 15 maybe athletes. We had um, track and field. I think we had judo, tennis. Um, we had more track and field, but no more than 10 or 15, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's 16, uh, only, I mean, being 16 years old, being the only 15, 16 athletes in the whole country, you're representing Haiti. And, uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's quite an achievement. And I mean, what would you say, I mean, let's, let's see, I mean, Cartan Global, Uh, the, the the travel agency and the author a ticket seller in Haiti as well. Um, mm-hmm. They 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 do uh, travel to um, to sport, sporting events. They've been this for mm-hmm. for a long time now. And what would you say to the people mm-hmm. that are thinking of going to the Olympic Games? I mean, the atmosphere of the Olympic Games. I mean, of course you can watch it on TV and it's it's, it's great, but To feel the 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 energy in, in the, the game, energy. You know? like how would you describe that? So I mean, for people that are like, oh, okay, maybe I, I I might go to the Olympic Games, but how would you what would you tell them? Well, you would you were going to talk to an athlete going to compete, right? An athlete and people in 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 general, like people, for example, that are thinking of going to the to the Olympics. That I say, okay, so the Olympics. Yeah, to go I as, mean, as a I, fan more than anything. I mean, as a fan, I mean, I want the fan to understand and maybe realize that all the players there, I mean, we leave, read the sport that we practice and to appreciate, you know, the what they're seeing, you know, because it's a lot of hard work, especially when you think about it. At least, you know, I remember my coach was telling me like tennis, you could play the first set bad, you know, poorly, and then you still have a chance to recuperate and, and, and win the match. Versus a, a track and field athlete that trained four years for that time. And then in a split of seconds, 10 seconds, the race is, is gone, you know? And yeah. so to me, he was telling me that as if like, you know what? You, you, you have a little advantage where you can progressively get into the game. So I think as a spectator, embrace every second of it. Because, you know, every sport is unique. And it's a lot of work that's, that's you know, the athlete put in to get where they are. And now as an athlete, you know, I would say... We worked hard our whole life to be there. So enjoy, embrace the moment and give it your all. You know, that's all we dream about, you know, to, 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 to be an Olympian and, and to raise that, you know, that medal at the end. It's even, you know, the, the, the cherry on top of the cake, you know. So it's just an amazing experience, whether you're a spectator or an athlete, because I went to see other sport and it was just, it was just simply amazing to see. And just like the competition, let's let's put the competition on, on one and the the atmosphere on the other side as well. Like the international interaction, your experience in the Olympic Village with all these athletes, staying, <laughs> staying there. Like, how was that? I mean, did you meet people from all over the world? And like, you see, you see, you you hear like all different languages in in a just in the dining hall. Like, it's it's crazy, no? I mean, to me, the the most imp- like. The memory, I actually have the bag in my, in my, it's in my closet. You know, those little pins, they, it was my thing every day when I could, when I was in a village to go and meet new players and exchange those, those, yeah. those pins with the athletes and I have a bag full of them. So to me, this was my, that was, the... <laughs> my, that was it, you know, and especially Haiti being a small country. So Haiti, we didn't have many, you know, pins versus the U S you find U S everywhere. So. It was even like to them, 
they were intrigued and interested in my country because a lot of them were like, where's Haiti? Where is it from? So that created a, you know, a, a, a vibe, I, if you would say, you know, to talk to other people and tell them about our country, our culture and exchange. And I have a piece of memory that's with me, you know, but I'm 37 now and it's still with me and I still look at them, you know, and I, I'll never forget that time. No, people who probably everywhere wanted the hey tipin, you know, because oh, this is so hard. <laughs> to get. Uh -huh. Yes. And you know, people like also who travel with uh, with Cartan, they also get the pins, and because it's part of an Olympic experience now, you know, yes. to, to exchange the pins, you see people like, I know, like it's it's a um, it's a one of a kind event, and um, I mean, but you also uh, uh, participate in Roland Garros, right? The Grand Slam. Yes. In Paris. I did. That's that's I mean that's a tennis uh, dream there. Of course, Wimbledon is one, but that's another one. Uh, yeah. You 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 got to the final when you were a junior as a double. Yes. How, as how, a was, double. how, how was that experience? Oh, it was it was <laughs> just amazing. Like to me, I think the semifinal because I lost in the final, but the semifinal, my semifinal, I played on a not a center court, but a court with you know, three quarter of the court had, um, was full. I yeah. played the best match in my life, you know? And I don't know the fact that it's Paris, I speak French, you know, we were there. It was just amazing, you know, and, and I have the trophy there, you know, I lost a few trophies through the earthquake that happened in Haiti, but that trophy, everything stayed at my parents, but that trophy is one of the trophies that came home with me. So <laughs> again, those are How memories were you that when you, when you were in Roland Garo? How old? I was 17. A okay, year so after the Olympics. A year after the Olympics. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna be I was gonna be 18. So it was a year after. Yeah. Now, and your partner, have you played with her before? Or it was the first time you played with her? Well, I played with her that summer leading up to the okay. to, to the French Open. We played the Wimbledon season also together, but we didn't do as well on the grass. Grass, it was my first time on grass. Hers also, you know, the grass is very different, but we played the whole summer together. So it wasn't a, a, a player. It was Annette Kolb. She's from Germany. And she, I mean, I've, I've I, you know, we used to be, you know, in the same tournaments often, but it was the first time that we played together. So Are you still in touch was, with her? Just out of curiosity, you, you, you talked um, to her? No, I, I, we, we kept in touch. You know, back then, technology wasn't what it is now. I actually tried to look her up the other day. And I found her name, but she's not on, I'm not on Facebook. She's, I think she's on Facebook. She's not on Instagram and I'm on Instagram. So yeah. I, I looked her up and I'm thinking to, you know, I should reach out to her again to, you know, cause those were the good old days, you <laughs> no, know? Like, you shared a really nice experience with, with her. Yeah, really. we did. You see, I'll never forget her. I mean, I have pictures and all of us together, but yeah, I should get back in touch with her. No, oh, nice. Uh, well, that's a, that's a dream. I mean, you as a 16, 17 year old, uh, Roland Garo and Sydney Olympics. Yeah, that's Sydney. And I played the US Open. US Open, I did pretty well. I lost in quarterfinals, singles and doubles, which was, nice. you know, um, and I lost the quarterfinals and singles to Kuznetsova. So, you know, she's, she's a pretty decent player. Pretty, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I think my, you know, my six, when I was between 16 and 18, my, my tennis level just boomed a lot. You know, that's when, I don't know, tennis clicked for me and I really, my level just, you know, went up a notch, you know, so I had great results. And that's 18, you started college uh, in USF. No. And I, how old were you? No, I didn't start um, college at 18. I took a... I took about a year and a half after I graduated to play professional. I actually won okay. one professional tournament. I did finals, semifinals. Um, and, uh, and then I decided to go to college because it was financially hard, you know? Yeah. So it, it, I, 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 you know, I decided, I mean, to go to college. So I did play in between juniors and college. I played professional, which gave me some um, NCAA problems. With my eligibility you know i was going to ask you that like because that's you if you're professional then you cannot uh, play college because you you you're supposed you're supposed to be an amateur no yeah well How in was... the u.s you can sign as an amateur as an amateur and not accept the money 
to make a long story short, I mean, you know, all those technical things, you know, I, I wasn't really aware of it. And when I became aware of it, I tried to change it to amateur because they had put in this new rule that if you were a player and you wanted to switch to amateur, you could do so. And it turned out to be great because it was at the time I was thinking of going to college because, you know, tennis can be very demanding and, you know, financially expensive. So I did that switch. You know, I changed to amateur, so I wasn't accepting money, which made it even harder because, you know, I was I, I didn't have any sponsorship or anyone to help me out with playing tournaments. So that's when I decided to go to college. And luckily, thank God I did that because if I hadn't switched while being a professional to an amateur, I don't think I would have gotten my eligibility. But I had to sit down my first year of college, which we were fighting with NCAA back and forth, you know, track my my schedule and everything. And then they allow me to play two seasons only. And my last season, I was out also. I couldn't play for the team. But I was, you know, an assistant coach and I still got my education. So I was only allowed to play two semesters. Okay. Well, I think my you, college. But you got to compete at NCAA D1 level, and yes, and then and then you compete. graduated from university. And did you did you want to go back to being professional at the time, or do you when what was your mindset at that, at that time? Um, at times I wanted to, you know, and. Uh, I know how much work it was, you know, to be a professional. And I don't think I was mentally prepared for that. You know, I, I, I guess I wanted a little break. And then I came back to Haiti, you know, and I, I must say, you know, not regret anything. But sometimes I'm like, maybe I should have given it a try again. But at the time, it was the right decision for me, you know. And I'm happy to say today, um, I, I, I said I wasn't going to touch a racket anymore. But when I came back to Haiti, people were like, oh, give lessons to my, to my kids and stuff. My sister-in-law was really pressuring me. So, and I did that. And November last year, I decided to be back on the court. And I did. And I'm actually going to play my first tournament in 13 years next Friday. Wow. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> so yeah. How long you been back in Haiti now since you... Since you Pretty much since you graduated, you came back to Haiti and you didn't go back to Florida afterwards? No, I, I graduated in December 2007. I've been back in Haiti since, ever since. Okay. I mean, of course, I go back to Florida on vacation, you know, yeah, back okay. in, you know, but but not, yeah, I I haven't. But yeah, I mean, I guess 13 years later, I'm happy to be back <laughs> on the court. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Like a, it's like a national tournament, or what's the what's the competition level, or just a local one? No, it's a, it's a local one. Um, again, with the COVID happening, tennis had died down in Haiti a little bit. But with the confinement, you know, and tennis being one of the sports that people can practice, you know, versus soccer where you're close. So tennis kind of like took a how can I say? Like, yeah, like a popularity in Haiti again, and people are playing and they, they were having some open tournaments. And now they, they had a, they had a couple, each club is doing their own tournament. And now they're having a, a tournament, you know, they're taking the best 34 players. And I'm the, like I said, in Haiti, there's not many women that play. So I'm the only woman that will be playing. So I'm happy to say that. So, yeah, so it's an open tournament that I'll be participating, you know? So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> nice, well, good luck. And, Thank uh, you. I'm curious, in Haiti, I mean, tennis, is it, uh, is, is, is it accessible or is or only if you play in a club or, is it, or are, there, are there public uh, courts? How, how, is, how does that work there? There are a few public courts, you know, but not, not many, no. not much. Don't forget, Haiti, 90, uh, let's say 90% 90, 90 of the population is really poor. Yeah. You know, and tennis is an expensive sport where you need rackets, balls, strings, you know. And I know Naomi Osaka is trying to help out because she's from Jacques Mel. It's outside of Port-au-Prince. You know, she, she you know, because that, that's where her dad is from. Mm -hmm. So she opened a small tennis academy there. But even then, there's not much accessibility. And but if you're not part of a club, it's 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 not easy. To find yeah. a court in Haiti. But don't you think but that's an that's an opportunity maybe for tennis in Haiti to maybe like 
get some 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 of the poor kids out of the streets and start playing a sport. I mean, you could, they they got you as an example. They got Naomi Osaka. I mean, even if only she's only half Haitian, um, maybe do you think like maybe uh, they, there there's something that can be done there to to promote uh, tennis or like or people are more are interested in football or other sports. No, I mean. <sighs> Me, I'm a believer in sport. I believe sport can open yeah. so many doors for you. Because even I, my parents in office sent for me to go to, to, to the, one of the best schools in the U.S., you know. And it gives you a discipline throughout life. You know, it doesn't have to be in sport. So I, I really believe in it. I think if, you know, if, if we can have a good team and the financial support to do it, you, you'll find tennis players. You, you will. Because I remember when I came back to Haiti, I traveled with a with a, a team to go to to a competition. They were young; they were 14 and 15. And the the people that don't have the financial, you know, the parents that that cannot, they're hungry for it, and they put in the the work that needs to, you know. So if there's a structure and a and an academy and and coaches that are there to structure them, I think I I think there's a great they're great potential, you know. As a lot of football players, you you know you find them, you don't find them on a, at at a tennis club. You know you find them somewhere where they play soccer with a can of soda. You know what I mean? So we do. We I believe we can if there is a structure and there's something that's put in place. Yeah, I say yes. To, to use sport, you know, to get people to, to 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 get their to get their attention in something productive and something meaningful, and. Yeah. And I think you're an example, uh, you know, like you, I mean, probably the whole country was watching you on, on the Olympics, you know, like saying, oh, look, Nisa, 16 year old, 18, you were in the news in Haiti, like maybe some kid would love to follow your dream as well, you know, like, yeah, so, no? I mean, now that I'm back, you know, playing again, because I was in hiatus, I wasn't, I was around, but not around. And now people are seeing me play. It's like they forgot about me and they forgot that I could play tennis and they're seeing me play. And they're like, wow, I forgot you could play. And <laughs> I am so amazed and happy to see, even if they're not young, but to see women back on the tennis court. It really makes me happy, you know? And so hopefully me playing also the tournament, I'll motivate young kids to play, you know? So sometimes I feel like, I'm nervous and all, but I'm like, you know what? There's a greater cause behind it. Maybe you being out there is going to motivate other, exactly. you know, at 30, you know, at 37, motivate other girls to go. Because I keep telling people, I'm like, listen, it's, you're not doing this to only be a professional. No, you know, you, you get to travel the world even as an, a junior player and then you get to go to college, you know? And then after that too, it gives you a discipline and a, 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 a sense, I don't know. To me, I believe in sports. Sure. So hopefully with me, you know, will motivate a lot of them to be back on the court and play. Maybe this uh, pandemic now, it's now you like, you, you're like reborn into, like the tennis was reborn in Haiti. Now maybe it's, a, you can reopen like a tennis academy for, for, so, for, for the kids <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, well, I'm back. I'm giving lessons. You know, I I, I tend to, to give more lessons to women. And there's a man that told me the other day, he goes, you only give lessons to women? I'm like, no, but it's turned out to be this way right now, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> so hopefully, yes. There's someone that told me, Nasa, you're creating a movement right now. But, you know, me being on the court, I don't like the politics behind it. I'm just going and playing. But I guess with me playing and seeing me play, it's motivating a lot of players to play, especially women. And I'm happy to, I mean, they, to they, see they, that. They'll remember, you know, like you're a hated <laughs> tennis player in the Olympics. So, yeah. Yes. No, I mean they they remember they know, but I don't think they saw me play because I was still young and my matches wasn't really televised. So you have a handful of players that know me, and the number one in Haiti right now, he's well known because he never stopped playing, and we grew up together. And they talk to him, so he talks to me, and he's like, "You're creating a movement right now." So hopefully, I'm I'm as long as I'm pushing people for the better and play tennis, that's all I can ask for, you know. <laughs> No, you, you just answered the next question that I was going to ask you. So, like, what's uh, what's your like your mission statement now, or like a motto, or like something that you like to to say to 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 athletes or like you know, that uh, that are like looking to pursue their dream of of uh, being uh, 
you know, to follow the, the, the dream of like, choose a sport and, and, and stick to it. And now you said, okay, I'm, 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 so I'm trying to motivate these people to, 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 to get tennis and pick it up. So, uh, yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. It's, 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 it's amazing. Just like this morning, I have this, this girl, she's, I used to go to school with her and she's been playing with me for two, three years and she never wanted to play matches. Never. And I wasn't pushing her, but right now she's into playing and stuff. And then it's so fun. All of them now, because I did a clinic. I, she's been here for two, three years. And then one day she goes, Nisa, let's do a clinic with two other girls. And now I'm coaching the two other girls, but they're constantly writing and asking, hey, I played a match. I did this. I did this wrong. I don't know. To me, it's fun. And, and I'm really happy that I'm motivating them to be on the court. So, you know, that's, yeah. that's all I can ask for right now. You said know? It, it's beyond <laughs> oneself, you know, like I'm doing it more to, to motivate other people. And I think that's, that's the message. And that's Yeah, nice. exactly. Yeah. Well, Nisa, thank you. I mean, I wish we can talk for longer. The, the coffee talk is for half an hour, but thank you very much for... Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, it was uh, a pleasure. Uh, this is a unique story, you know, that, uh, you know, this, all these stories that don't get, don't get told. And uh, thank you, Nisa, for taking the time to share it. And, uh, well, uh, thank you all for tuning in. And we will see you next week for the next Coffee Talk. Thank you.